Welcome to the 91 Untold Change Project. I'm Neil Armand, your host for this series of podcasts. Uh, on today's episode, I'm going to be talking to John Seymour, who's a, a real mentor of mine. Um, I've been lucky enough to, to work with John over a number of years, uh, and he mentored me to become uh, my own master trainer of NLP, which is really his specialism. Uh, he's one of the first English people to teach NLP, neurolinguistic programming, in the UK. Uh, also, particularly known as author of Introducing NLP, which he co-authored with Joseph O'Connor. Um, why did we want to talk to John? Well, because he, he has got this vast experience of applied psychology, uh, but also he's had a fascination around systems thinking over the last 30 years or so, and equally memetics. And we felt that 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 sort of trilogy coming together would add real value uh, to the, the work that we're doing with The Change Project. So I hope you enjoy the show. One very brief uh, disclaimer, this was filmed quite early in the, the process, so the video quality isn't up to our 100% of our standards, uh, but it's still very good. <laughs> Welcome to the 91 Untold Change Project. The whole universe is in a state of entropy. If you can unlock that higher motivation, they'll be with you. How can you create an environment where people can find meaning at work? That can create the needed culture change. How does radical change happen? You know it's a good business. In terms of our evolution, we were not required to have a conscious understanding of complex systems. What creates great innovation in the social arena? It does it. You taking action. Have some real sense of control over our lives. So, good morning, John. Good morning. Um, I thought I'd start off with probably the biggest question of all. And normally we leave this to later in the podcast, but with you, I'm afraid I'm asking it up front. How does change happen? Yeah, the big one, as you say. Well, also behind it is what is change anyway? And, you know, a, a key part is pinning down what's the problem bit that you want to change and looking at where you would get to if you had changed that. So when you ask, what was the original question? How does change How happen? does change happen? Well, it will happen if there is some motivation for one or more people to go from where they are to where they rather, they'd rather be. And a lot of that is soft internal stuff. And so sometimes you're working with people individually. Uh, other times you're out in organizations and there are, I think of them as meme fields of people with different thoughts and beliefs about change and so on. And it's quite a skill finding out whether there or not change is going to happen. I, I mean, I think there are what I call hygiene factors, that unless pe most people or the key people are sufficiently motivated, it doesn't matter what you do, the system is going to tend to continue doing what the system always does. And there's no mileage in trying to get change to happen when it doesn't want to happen. So it's almost like sensing, does change want to happen here or not? And, and if it does, to start exploring what are the necessary and sufficient steps to start making small differences that add up to whatever big difference people want. So how do you do that sensing? First thought is unconsciously. I, I, it, it, it's being aware that change does not always want to happen. And if you've got a filter set for, well, does it want to happen here or not? Then I think either that pulls you in towards doing the things that will get change happen, or it pulls you towards the hygiene factors and you go, well, wait a sec, do enough people in this organization think this is an issue that we're likely to get success with it or not? You know, or, or does the boss give it his blessing? Because if he doesn't, we've got problems. And so let's assume for a second that that isn't the case, that, that people aren't motivated. You mentioned about motivation a few moments ago. Mm. If motivation isn't present, how do you achieve motivation? Tricky one. Bottom line, you don't. But there are some fudge factors in practice, everybody is going to be motivated by something or other, unless they're completely depressive and down and out. So you can get some mileage by finding out what does motivate people and try and morph that over 
towards something that doesn't. I'm always a bit cautious myself because you're pushing rivers when you do that. You're not going with the system's dynamics. But so I guess a different question comes in. If there if you can't find adequate motivation for what they say they want, what's the basis for moving ahead? And I would usually kind of bottom that line that out with a person or an organization say look you know it doesn't seem that motivating to you or to a lot of the people um, is it worth spending the time going ahead and doing this and what would make it worth doing it because on the face of it this is a change that doesn't want to happen so interesting question when change does and doesn't want to happen how you sense it and how you test drive different options yeah i'd like to go a bit deeper into that if we may because that when you talked about sensing it you talked about it being an unconscious process but if i haven't done that before i've not been in an environment where i've sensed and i i have enough experience to be able to tell ah, it's this or the other how would one know it's like you're asking, so how do you harness unconscious skills, given that they're unconscious? I, I, with that one, you take something like, well, when was a time when you were sensing something, usually in a quite different context? You know, maybe it's gardening or bowls or something quite different and you just had an intuition. Um, so you find a reference experience of sensing. Th then the other bit that works for me is that conscious tiny mind, as I like to call it, knows it doesn't know how to find the answer to very complex questions. The best thing it can do is shut up and get out of the way. Now, if you can get your conscious mind to shut up and get out of the way and be very comfortable not knowing, that puts you into a kind of default sensing mode where you're able to notice things that you wouldn't otherwise notice or notice them in ways you wouldn't otherwise notice them. And it's the strangest sensation because through that know-nothing approach, stuff emerges that when you test drive it by actioning it, it's more effective than you would think. But it takes quite a few repeats before I'm comfortable relying on a, a process of not knowing, but but that would be a way of developing the sensing circuitry, letting go of conscious mind's um, belief that it understands things or it can solve things, when a lot of the evidence is that conscious mind is perhaps the smallest part of wider mind, unconscious mm. mind, whatever you call it, deep mind. Okay, I like that. It, you also talked about hygiene factors. Do they mm. play a part in that? sensing circuitry and if so what are they i honestly don't consciously recall them I, I know at times i've i've seen and written lists of hygiene factors often half a dozen i haven't got a clue at the moment um but in the sensing mode objections pop up and clearly are objections and you go oh wait a sec so you people in human resources have decided this would be a good thing to do, but you've not reality checked it with with people on the shop floor or the equivalent. Um, I think we need to do that. And they'll either do it and it's fine and it resolves itself, or they won't. And then I, I get very nervous because I've learned not to spend time on projects which are doomed to not go anywhere useful. It's a waste of my time, it's a waste of theirs. So I guess with repetitions, you get more sensitive to stuff that might go wrong and learn to pick it up earlier and go for, um, it's almost like going for a bottom line or I sometimes think of it, it's like putting somebody on a fence. They have to decide, they have to jump one way or another yes. because hovering in the middle isn't going to get anywhere. So, and as long as I'm not attached to which way they jump, I'll very nicely ask people to jump. I like that. There's... Uh on a lot of our courses, I'll often talk to students about leverage and um, asking a client uh, on a scale of one to ten, how much do you want to change? How much yeah. do you want this change? Yeah. And one of the things I continually say is I won't work with anyone who isn't a seven or above. Do you have some sort of system like that that you use or is it just an internal process? I think it's very similar to you. I, I, 
I don't code it as a seven or above, but functionally it's like that. When I'm conversationally going, well, you know, what is it you're actually after here? I'm reading congruence. I'll, I'll ask them about consequences, both intended and unintended. Um, and that congruence reading is a very good permission signal for how far you can or can't go with this person in, in this situation. Okay. So very similar reading congruence because if there's not enough uh, well there's not there's got to be enough congruence to proceed but if there are incongruences it's kind of like when you're working with an individual what stops you oh I can't because well you need to shift whatever the limiting belief is because if it remains intact it will and does stop them so it, it's finding the incongruences and working through those to get to a point of greater congruence is one way of thinking okay you talked about meme fields. Mm. Uh, can you explain that a little bit more? What, what impact do, do they have in the world of change? I can certainly try, but, but now I think I've got a belief that I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so meme fields, what are meme fields? I find this useful when I'm working with groups, either in social change projects or organisational change projects. Because my tiny mind can't hold an awful lot of people and lots of different opinions and views, I simply do the thing of going, well, I know that they've all got opinions and views, so and I know I don't know what they are, so by scanning the meme fields, as it were, views that seem significant, either because they confirm I'm on track with something or because they disconfirm and go, no, no, this does not fit, you need to change track here, they tend to emerge. So it's a bit like the strategy of not knowing again, that just by being aware that there are meme fields, you almost develop, your unconscious mind develops hypotheses as to what these may or may not be based on what people are saying or doing. So you, you've got a kind of virtual map. And you know, I think partly it sounds absolutely crazy, but, but with all of these things, if it's useful in practice, you can't afford to bin it, because change is hard enough, you need everything working on side. So that would be my thoughts on that. Lovely. Could you just define what a meme is? Uh, yeah, this is, this is dear old Richard Dawkins back in 1976, I think it was. I um, can't remember the name of his book now. But, oh, The Selfish Gene, that was it. Now, he coined the term memes, and, and he explained it along the lines that it's any bit of behaviour that spreads in human cultures that has both an internal component, something that happens in our inner experience, and an external component, something that happens in the outside world that anybody could see or hear. And if it has both of those components and it spreads, it's a meme. Now, usually they explain memes in terms of you know, like when one person's singing a tune and you find yourself singing the same tune, or when one person yawns and then suddenly everybody starts yawning, patterns of behaviour do clearly spread around. Well, when you expand this up and, and kind of go, OK, well, is there a fully-fledged meme theory here that we can do something with? Um, personally, I think there is. But it's quite tricky because everything is memes. When you apply mm. the meme filter... A word meme is a meme. Um, a, a gesture can be a meme. Hello, waving hand. Uh, a sentence can be a meme. A belief can be a meme. Memes come in all kinds of clusters and combinations. And it's mentally very challenging to come up with any coherent model of these, which is why I resort to meme fields. We know that in a sense our subjective and shared realities are just made up of thought forms and these assume a reality so holding the meme field question I think gives a better ability to identify thought forms that are significant in some way and that you can do something with to enable people to get to where they want um, there was a book called I think it was Susan Blackmore called The Meme Machine, and she tried to make the case, and I think has made the best case of any of the stuff I've read on memes, for meme theory, 
mimetics as some people like to call it, as a field that will develop. The, the problem at the moment is that science can't really get its hands on it because it can get its hands on the external bit of a behaviour, but science can't deal with subjective experience. You'd, you'd need a different methodology, you know, something like NLP, or something that targets precisely subjective experience to capture that end of it. So the whole thing kind of looks unscientific. You can't... On the other hand, the pure subjectivity of it gives a degree of freedom and possibility you couldn't get if you were solely scientific about meme theory and its practical applications. And I just have a hunch that it's rather like Darwin looking at natural selection, you know, all that time ago. We're looking at a kind of a selection in our own meme fields that has a greater significance than we're aware of. And also it's very hard for us to be aware of our meme fields at one sense. I personally find it fascinating because when you look at bigger change projects uh, there will be some patterns of thought and behaviour that make absolutely critical differences to the project whether it's an individual or an organisation um, and it's important as a change agent to be able to home in on those and there's no simple formula for doing that. That's really interesting John and so how could somebody use memetics or memes? Um, you know, how is it useful to us in our journey of change? Well, that's the killer question. I, it's not been well developed. It's kind of theoretically interesting. I, I think the how-tos, I can only speak from my experience in working uh, in facilitating change, particularly through stuff like NLP, that does focus on bits of behaviour. So it focuses you on the right granular level of a meme, you know, you're working with a limiting belief I can't, I'm no good at, um, that is a meme. It has an internal component, it has an external effect, and with NLP you work at, that, at a level of detail that makes it easiest to shift the belief, because shifting beliefs, unless it is easy, isn't easy. <laughs> we get stuck in our beliefs, we identify with our beliefs. So, I, I, and my answer to that is I tend to work with memes through an NLP type approach, which does focus you in more detail on bits and pieces of thought and behaviour. And for those people who aren't NLP trained, any thoughts on, on specific ways of doing that without coming on one of our courses? Okay, well if, if you know background in NLP then I mean, you don't need a background. There's a, there's a commonsensical version of NLP which goes something like, although life seems to be what's on the outside of us, we actually live our lives on the inside. And on the inside, there are only a few major kind of thought forms around. There, there is, we see images, we talk to ourselves, we feel our feelings, uh, we have beliefs about ourselves and the world and what's possible and what's not, and those make up the structure of inner experience. So you don't need to be fancy with NLP, but there is something about developing the skill of noticing what your experience is. And that means being the observer of your inner experience and almost stepping back from yourself so you can see your thoughts, you hear what you're saying to yourself. And from that viewpoint, sort out the stuff that is useful from the stuff that we all trip up over because it's not that useful. You know, all of the self-beat-up strategies and so on don't do an awful lot and do, do trash the quality of life for something like 80% of the population. Mm. So you don't need to be into NLP, but may, perhaps you need some reflective ability, some mindfulness practice of some type or kind to develop that muscle so you don't just identify with what you're thinking and feeling and therefore get stuck in it, but you are able to step out of it simultaneously and choose whether this flow that's coming in from unconscious mind is serving you or isn't serving you. And it's that inner observer part that makes the, the judgment call as to what you run with and what you don't. And I think that makes a huge difference to the quality of life. I agree. And so when you've got that ability to reflect in, in both perspectives, how do you challenge beliefs? 
Okay. If you're aware of a belief that you're holding that's perhaps limiting you or, or stopping you from moving where you need to get to, how do you actually challenge it? Well, the first thing I would say is even if you're quite good at stepping back from your inner experience, I suspect a lot of the time you're not stepped back from at all, you're in it. So I don't want to make it sound like that's easy because that's why the wisdom traditions of the world have developed meditation techniques that take years of practice to, to shift the level of awareness and consciousness. But having said that, how do you change a limiting belief? Well, the easy way for me is to go, well, all beliefs are in a sense just beliefs. They're made up things about reality. Uh, we, at a fundamental level, we kind of don't know what reality is. If you look at anything through scientific filters, you walk off the edge of the world pretty fast. So if you know a belief is just a kind of thought form that pops up, it's a lot easier to escape from it if you don't really believe it. So there's something about loosening the belief and being sceptical about your own limiting beliefs. And, and then the other thing is an old limiting belief isn't going to disappear because it was doing a job, so you tend to need something else in its place. So a question that stayed with me for years was, what would it be more useful to believe than this? Yes. And, and that, I found, stacked up and made a lot of difference. But I think the more you work with your own beliefs, the more you become aware of them, the more you shift from being the servant of your belief systems to being, I won't exactly call it the master of your beliefs, because it, it isn't like that, but beliefs are more variables that you have choice over rather than things that you simply get stuck in. So that's some thoughts on how you go about shifting them, but it's a skill in itself, and the more you do it, the easier it gets. And what about if that limiting belief exists in a team or a group or, or a community even? Mm. Are there any thoughts you've got on how to, to shift it at that level? I'm not sure they do. I think that's much trickier. If you've got a limiting belief embedded in a whole community, because we're social creatures, that carries undue weight with us. It will tend to be self-evidently true. You know, for, for example, to have on planet Earth a, a money system um, that relies on indefinite growth at one level seems absolutely true and obvious, yet at another level it's completely barking mad. You cannot grow any system indefinitely on a finite planet. It's, it's, it's madness. So I don't know where you go with that. Mm. I, it, so, I mean... It leads you into a different area. If you're talking about shared limiting beliefs, this is a close relative of something like culture change, where you're trying to change the beliefs about how things are around here. And I, I guess that's the approach I would go for, where it's important enough. You then get explicit about what the beliefs of the organisation or the, or the culture actually are and what they're trying to move towards. But that, I think that takes quite a lot of work, shifting that stuff around, and, and is often regarded as some of the hardest problems in change, if, if culture change is involved. I think most people regard that as very tricky. I agree. So how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to well, be a bit Well, first of all, you this. believe it's possible. Yeah. Okay. But how do you do culture change? I suppose it's like any change work. You have to start by making the complex simple enough that you can get your head around it and do something testable. So if you're looking at culture change, the first question is from what to what? And, and to try and pin down with the key people involved um, what it is that they're considering highly problematic and want to shift away from and what it is they want to move towards that would count as a full and complete resolution of whatever they had previously viewed as a difficulty. So you've got to pin the stuff down. And that's, that can take quite a while if you've got multiple key players involved. But, but you do that, you pin down a multiple description. So you've then taken a, a what in system terms is a complex mess, and pinned it down to, we are at A, we need to get to B. Uh, that, so by trial and error, 
you simply go, okay, what are the smallest moves that can take us effectively from A to B whilst being testable moves to see whether they actually work or not? And if they don't, you immediately substitute another move. So you then make a progression of moves to try and get from A to B. And it doesn't it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. For example, in a normal organisation, there are what I call the key influencers. These are the often 10% or so that if they go along with a particular change, the changes are done deed uh, because they influence everybody else. I was saying earlier, we're social creatures. We pick up on other people's beliefs and so on. Um, but if you can't get those key influencers on board, then that's bad news in terms of success of the project. Mm. I, I, in my experience... That's almost a necessary requirement that the key influencers are aligned and on board. Then, through time and interaction, the group will go along with it, and that's how you get a culture to shift or change. So getting clear on who those influencers are up front seems yeah. an important part of creating yeah. change. Yeah, and you often do that quite informally. You know, it's like the thing when you go in for a first meeting and you throw in a, a silly question like, I've forgotten what time are we having coffee? And you just scan the non-verbals and people will visually defer to whoever the key decision maker in the room is. It might be the boss, but it's just as likely to be the boss's secretary or somebody else that's actually covertly running the show in the background. Yeah. But you need to pick up on that and not be fooled by the surface structure of the organisation. And then I like to check, well, what's the last time you had a significant change around here? Who was involved in that? Were all the key influencers on site there? How did that get to be? So you actually model the process that has already occurred in order to replicate it interesting i've got a a a board i'm working with at the moment uh probably the most dysfunctional board that that i've ever met where there's i think five people uh key parts of the the board they all believe different things yeah what would you do this is me trying to get some tips and advice now but what (laughs) what would you do to try and create alignment there when they actually all want completely different things. You'd, you'd swear they were all leaders of different political parties, to be honest. Mm. I, like so much change stuff, I don't have any quick answer to that. I, one, I, I would tend... You know, it's all in how you think about these things. You know, As you were saying that, they all believe different things. A uh, part of me was going, well, I bet they all believe similar things as well, and I wonder where the differences are between what they believe that's different and what's in similar. And then I was going, well, I wonder if you chunk them up, what you get up to in terms of similarity, or chunk it back down, would you find underlying similar? So I think a lot of the change process is about thinking about how you think. Because it may be that change is relatively easy. It does, after all, happen the whole time. Um, But our thinking makes it very complicated. So, and in terms of practical solutions to that, if I was in your shoes, I would just find myself getting very curious, you know, bouncing it back and saying, it's really interesting, you all seem to have completely different views. I'm wondering what's the basis of similarity that enables you to function as a group. Or, in fact, is it important that you function by all having different... You know, you just get yeah. curious and ask questions. And when you do that, I don't know what the answers are, but, uh, but those answers whether will either lead you towards something that becomes part of a solution or lead you to abandon that path because it clearly is not part of any solution. So in a sense, it's just a flexibility drill for you as to how curious you get and how many moves you can make to find out something that leads somewhere useful. And I think that's a general strategy for any time you get stuck, Mm -hmm. is to go, okay, I'm stuck, I'm stuck in my thinking. How have I got myself stuck? What are my presuppositions? What else could I think? Oh, I could do this, I could do that. Lovely. I'm on the right track then. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yes, but it is unnerving because you never quite know you are. And in a sense, you're always off track. Um, So it's a strange business, the change business. Uh, Yes. And it goes back to that question we were talking about earlier about motivation. Mm. Uh, And it, it, it is, I find it deeply frustrating when I'm looking at an organization and people are seemingly defending their little fiefdoms, um, and you can see the system of the organization mm. really mm. suffering as a result of that. Mm. But it's kind of working for them. Yeah. And but dysfunctional systems have the ways in which they are functional and do work. But nevertheless, they are dysfunctional. And other systems 
uh, could work better. But when you're moving towards systems, one of the, the classic interventions is, uh, you know, I think people, we tend to have blind spots about systems because in terms of our evolution, we were not required to have a conscious understanding of complex systems. We could get by quite nicely without one. But, but now, um, it does look like we need to understand our systems a bit better. And I think one of the first moves, I can remember doing this with the National Centre for Alternative Technology many decades ago, was getting, helping them build a model of their own systems. Because they had a kind of formal model and, you know, he, he was the, the leader and so and so did the communications. But they, it wasn't that explicit at all. And just the act of making it explicit and have them map out how their own systems worked uh, made a significant difference to them. It showed up some obvious improvements could be made quite quickly, easily, and showed up some dysfunctions that could be abandoned equally quickly and easily. But there's something about people modelling their own systems which is as true of organisations as it is of individuals, where you're also modelling your own system, whether you formally think of it like that or not. Or not. So, as they created that map, having modelled out their own system, what sort of things were on that map? How did it look different from a traditional structure? This is 40 years ago. I can't remember a single thing that was on the map. I remember that they were fascinated by being asked to map how they actually worked with a, from a systemic viewpoint. Mm. I was into Stafford Beer's viable systems models then. Um, and they just found it as intriguing as an individual does when they come across self-development for the first time and go, oh, good grief, you mean there are a bunch of skills that I can learn and I can improve the quality of my life and who I am and give myself an easier time and have more satisfaction? It's, you know, it's, an, it's a state development thing. It's an eye-opener. So was that taking it from almost the, the traditional organisational hierarchical model and saying how do things really work around here or how do you get into mapping out those systems and yep. modeling them yeah exactly as you say when you go into an organization my experience they will usually give you the hierarchical model first and i usually just put that on one side because i don't think i've ever yet met an organization that works the way its hierarchical <laughs> organization says it should and that's one of the big questions in change how does this organization actually work um so that's why you have to get into asking questions. And you usually do that through, I found it easiest, through picking something that happened before, some, some crisis or emergency or whatever, and I go, OK, so when that happened, t talk me through that. How, how did it start? Who first noticed it? Who did they tell? What happened then? And you're building a map of the organisation as a living being, engaging with some particular piece of content. And that map is what serves you in good stead when you're, you're looking at any future change. You've got a map of how the organisation really works. You know, as I say, the classic example is the secretary that actually runs mm. the show and the boss that thinks he does. Probably says it as well as any other example. You have to tap in to the secretary and the other people like that that actually are keeping the whole thing afloat. So if I understand right, you're effectively codifying something that happened historically to work out yeah. what happened and then you're mapping against it with the current challenge how does this relate back if this is how it worked last time how will this yeah. will this work in the same way is, will there be differences and and through yeah. that method you're building the map yes and it's much easier for them because if you take them to a concrete experience they will tell you their stories and what happened and so on well, all you have to do is map that out uh, i'll often do it visually and, and it gives you a, a working map of how they actually work and key people um, so that you can then pick mm. that up and use it you know if you didn't do that you'd be reinventing a wheel and why do that okay so how can someone react effectively to change you know we'd, we've talked quite a bit about change and that I mean, it feels to me that change is pretty much a constant for for most of us and part of what you're talking about is this awareness of self as well and it feels like change is happening out there and around us how can we prepare for that how can we react to it effectively 
Okay. So the central question is how do you react effectively to change? It's got a presupposition that we can react to change ineffectively, and I guess that bears spelling out. If something happens in the outside world that looks bad, or bad in its consequences for me, I will then react badly to that. So you go, okay, so what are the differences between that and people that react more effectively? They'll come from a different place, a different presupposition. To react effectively to change, one change is a constant, and the illusion that change isn't happening is just an illusion. But to react effectively to it, it's not the change itself that makes the difference, it's what you do with the change, how you utilise that change that makes a difference and leaves you with at least some illusion of control. And I think we like to have our illusions of control. So, to react effectively to change, you're sensing the external environment for any relevant changes which will pop up when they happen, and you're sensing the internal environment simultaneously. And this brings us to the inner observer, because if you're not aware of your internal environment, you can't be tracking the changes that you might have made. You know, as in, oh my God, my job is going to be outsourced. Uh, a panic, panic, panic. Whereas if you're observing, you go, oh, that's interesting, just a rumour that the job might be outsourced. There's enough to have me panicking like crazy and getting into all kinds of scenarios. Don't think I'll bother to do that, I'll just go and check the source. <laughs> 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 you know, all is not what it seems, but a, a lot of our conscious energy seems to be dysfunctional in a way as it doesn't obviously serve us. How does it serve you to, to spend all your time worrying about future consequences? Um, when you only need to spend a little time worrying about the ones that matter and having a game plan and, and then let go. But, but that's something to do with the nature of mind and its rather compulsive nature, which is a whole other dilemma, other mm. area to go into. Do you want to go into it now? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Or any, well, well, any gems coming from it, from just that? Okay, gems on the nature of mind, I, yeah. I don't know. But there is this theme to the wisdom tradition, which I mentioned before, which is that it's awareness of the workings of our mind that opens the pathway to giving us freedom from the workings of our mind, and hence all the different meditation techniques. And, and also getting at some deep level that conscious mind's job seems to be to have an endless stream of thoughts. Unconscious mind will pop them in if conscious mind goes blank at any reason. But actually, the winning move isn't having your unconscious mind flood your conscious mind uncritically with thoughts. The winning move is standing back and going, oh, that's interesting, I just thought that. Oh, that's interesting, I just went into that one there. Is that useful? No, I don't think it is. Yes, I do think it is. You've then got a dynamic interaction between unconscious mind, conscious mind, and the observer of the dynamic interaction of conscious and unconscious mind. And strangely enough, according to the traditions, when you get into that stuff, it's as though your conscious mind is able to set down unnecessary thinking. It becomes okay to just sit and look out of the window. And if a thought pops up, um, you probably wouldn't pursue it, because actually you're fine looking out the window. <laughs> this is a very different state of mind to what I think is normal in our culture. So, so there's very interesting stuff about how we experience our thought forms, our relationship to them, and being able to set them down. And it seems that... It's much easier to have experiences of peace and satisfaction and being absolutely okay as I am, the more you're able to set down thoughts, especially critical thoughts, and just not get attached to them. And if you're going to be optimistic about this, you would say that is our natural state. Um, it may be natural for some who've followed the pathways, but I suspect it's not natural for most people in, in our present culture. Mm. It has, those kind of skills have to be learnt. And learning those skills gives a way to reduce the apparent suffering, which seems to be such a part of life. You talked about I mean, an example of someone whose job might be outsourced and the way in which they're going to 
interact mm. with that and think mm. about it. One of the, the things that does interest us is how the world is changing and that so many different jobs and industries even seem like they might be obsolete for whatever reason you know take retail as an example or, or, or whatever that there are big big changes afoot so almost putting your futurologist hat on for a second what do you think is going to be different in the world in five or ten years or what, what industries do you think are going to be obsolete or significantly changed I'm not sure that I'm going to go there because the, the, in that kind of a time scale, five to ten years, I think we're probably going to see some fundamental changes in how we do things. The, I mean, at the moment, or, there's many articles saying, oh, you know, the, the crash of 2008 or whatever it was, um, is going to reoccur because we never sorted out the problem. I think that's right, and I think the fundamental systems of... of continuing growth on a finite planet will have to change and I think the the mean fields as it were are moving in that direction the days of austerity are limited people are looking at what else is around young people especially like the word socialist and in my my lifetime socialist has gone from being good to being very very bad <laughs> and is now popping back in as, as being fashionable so I think we're going to see fundamental changes in our systems because if we don't, it's hard to see that we have any long-term future. And I think we're going to get hit by bigger and bigger climate change whammies and things like that mm. in short order. So there's going to be some waking up from the process of group denial. That changes everything. So I think I'm going to ask you to reformulate the question. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I have a trouble with the simple prediction of, of what's yeah. going to work because I think we're lining up for major systems change and that will change everything well maybe the question that comes from that then is how do you prepare how do you okay how do you prepare for for major system change yeah well classically um people and organizations that prepare best do their preparation they go they don't do the denial they go oh good grief yeah the days of this system are limited um so what are my options? What are our options? How can we segue across from where we are to where we'd rather be in a grounded, evidence-based way so we test drive stuff? Um, and it's a process of, in one sense, continual change. But when I look at the students that have done best in life over the years in some very broad sense, that's one of their characteristics. They go, look, if, if I'm not driving my own change, then change is going to be happening to me, and it won't be the change that I want. So they're, they're very much the creators of their own change. I'm thinking of one guy, Paul his name was, who was, I don't know if I can use a company name here, but this was way back, and he was in charge of cleaning up problems for uh, one of the biggest computer firms. Uh, in Europe. So he got some absolute humdingers of problems. And I was fascinated by him and how he thought about this. And, and, and a lot of what I've said came from talking with people like Paul, that if you think you've got a solution to something, then you're probably stuck before you start. You have to go in not knowing and do a lot of serious inquiry and build relationships with all key people. And what was I going to say about Paul? Yeah, I remember one conversation. I said, but look, Paul, any one of those things could go drastically wrong and you'd be up for the chop. He said, fine by me. I don't have any problem with that. I'm getting a bit bored with solving these. I'm happy for a change. And it, that attitude was common to them all. Mm. You know, change was just as likely to be good as bad. And that's not common to most people. And that's because of their internal ability to harness their own inner resources, as well as social resources, uh, and be the creators of change in their life, knowing that it's not easy. But if you persist, that's probably the single factor that will give you the greatest chance of coming, coming through on navigating the changes of, of your life journey. Okay. And so rather than push you on what industries are going to be obsolete, you sort of said, I've got to reframe the question. So I want to do that to the positive. What examples have you found of people who have made that transition successfully or, or, or you think, 
are doing something to try and protect themselves from the changes in the world. Use it as an opportunity to grow. I think that there's a lot of the stuff I'm reading about change at the moment is about the importance of bottom-up and local initiatives. And I, I think those are the examples that come to mind, people that in any part of the world, they kind of get stuck with the big problems because on your own you can't do very much about the big problems. And that, But it does leave them with a motivation to do something. And doing something usually ends up local and mm. small scale. So they'll go, what can I do on my own? Or what can I do with a small group of us? You know, perhaps we could. Uh, I'll give you an example in the town where I live, a group together have got together and they're going to build a, it's basically a barn and it's, it's for different social events because there, there isn't one of that kind doing the job in town and it's halfway through its process. It looks like it's going to happen and this is local people just getting together and going, yeah, we want to do this. Um, if it's not for local tasks like that, I mean, some people do go for the bigger projects, and that's another option. You get quite ambitious and quite big, and some of those will pay off, most of them won't. Um, and I suppose the other thing is, if you don't develop something that's important to you, you are more vulnerable to the changes in society in a stage which I call the down wave, which is kind of limiting belief, scarcity. I think that's the stage we're in at the moment. You're just very vulnerable to those, whereas if you're doing your own thing, whether it's locally or with a group in business or out, it gives you agency and you don't feel so vulnerable. And I think that's something that's rising at the moment. And I think that's something that will rise a lot more in, in the times of change that are coming. Great. So it's almost people reacting, you know, taking the change, being positive about it. I think that agency piece is, is important as well. What, what can create agency? It is, because our systems are so massive that it's very easy to experience not agency, but what they call enemy, just kind of normlessness. It's all a bit hopeless and vast and why bother? Which isn't, of course, the healthiest approach to life. <laughs> So I think that's quite profound. Uh, so really, if I understand you correctly there, one of the best ways to prepare for change is get out there and change something, be in charge, even if it's small, take some agency for being in charge of some sort of change. It seems to be so. And I think the key skill there is well, knowing that that's important, but then finding the bit that you can achieve more agency over. And the more you tend to do that, the more that will grow and develop as a skill. Uh, but, but I have to say, when something big happens, like you lose your job, no matter how sophisticated you are about it, you're still going to experience the traumas that go with that, it's just you won't be disabled with them. You will much more easily move to, okay, I've got a chance for a fresh start. Oh, that's a relief. Mm. I didn't see that coming up. Now, what is it I really want to get stuck into? And then something new can emerge from doing that. And that, that's an inner agency thing. So, John, thank you as ever for talking to us today. It's been a delight. Uh, really appreciate you coming in and sitting on the 91 Untold sofa. You're welcome. I've really enjoyed the questions and the conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> I look forward to the next adventures ahead. Great. Thank you for listening to this 91 Untold Change Project podcast. I'm Neil Armand. Uh, if you've enjoyed it, please subscribe. You can also keep in touch with our adventures on social or at 91untold.com. Thank you for listening and we look forward to the adventures ahead. Yeah.